Oh, good. Let me do it. Awesome. Um, and hopefully I won't hear the participants coming in, but we'll mm. see. If so, I'll pause for a moment. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm super excited to be here with you guys tonight um, for this talk on herbal remedies for sleep. And as you know, my book, Herbal Remedies for Sleep, which is should I have this handy? Is right here. Um, is now released, and actually, my books for me to send are going to be arriving tomorrow. So I am taking orders through my website, and I will be shipping them out in the midst of the storm this week. And uh, but you can also get the book anywhere where books are sold, or if you don't even want the book, that's totally okay. We are gonna cover information just kind of like together today. So you'll be able to get some really wonderful tips on herbs that support sleep for tonight's talk. So we're just going to be focusing in on one small aspect of the many herbs and topics that are within the book on stress and sleep and relaxation. And what I decided to just focus in on for tonight, especially because this is a class that I was partnering with the co-op for, are herbs that are regularly available in commerce. So if you're not making your own apothecary, you know, if you don't have your own garden, plants that are readily available, that are some of the most popular plants, and also some of the ones that are the best researched just to support sleep. And specifically from that more kind of relaxing, sedating, sleep supportive aspect. So I'll dive right in, but just a little bit. I'm Maria Noel Groves. I'm a clinical herbalist, and I am now based in Chichester. I just moved a couple months ago, and I have a couple of different books. I have three books. This is the third one, and then a fourth one that I just submitted last night to the publishers that are going to come out next spring on a to-be-announced topic. There are slides available for you to download uh, if you, and actually I can plug this in the chat box right now. Let me find the chat box. Chat. And feel free to, if you have questions, to put them in the chat box. Most likely I'm going to save questions for the end, but if I notice something come through, I will, um, I might answer it sooner. So if you just go to my wintergreen botanicals dot com website and then backslash class notes. There is a link on there, at least for a temporary period of time to download the slides. So that is now in the chat box, but wintergreenbotanicals.com and it's backslash class notes, or you can go to the learn more tab and then from the learn more tab to the class notes. And there's a link for you to do that. Once you have the slides, uh, you can just open up the PDF on your computer. And when you have the PDF, if you see underlined things on them, those are things that you can click on and it'll bring up studies and other resources for extra information if you're interested. I am a total oversharer, so I'm always providing lots and lots of information. So those are the three books. And on my website, if you don't already know, I have lots of information available for free on recipes or walk, blog, uh, selected class notes, a few videos, podcasts, YouTube channel, there's all sorts of free information about herbs that you can find on the website. So you're welcome to check that out if you'd like to. And uh, you can also join my mailing list. And of course you can do like consults, classes, books. I have a series launching next week and my home herbalist series starting in June. My basic safety rules, I think this is important to start with because I don't know this audience. I don't know if you've already taken classes with me or not or where you're coming from. But of course, this is really just general information. This is not customized health advice for you. I'm really just aiming to educate and help you learn more about what kinds of options are available. But I don't know your health history. I don't know your constitution. I don't know what medications you might be on. And so you're going to want to do a little extra digging to figure out whether or not a specific herb actually is right for you. And of course, it's always a good idea to keep your doctor in the loop. I mean, I'm not a doctor, even when people do see me in consult, so I can't diagnose or prescribe legally and ethically anyway, but your doctor should always be in the loop. Some doctors know a little bit about herbs. Most don't but they're still a really great part of your healthcare team. And it's great for them to know what you're up to and what's going on and, uh, and just be part of that team with you. You could also seek out a herbalist or a naturopathic doctor or somebody else like that, that is trained in natural and herbal medicine. If you wanted additional guidance, if you didn't feel comfortable, say self-treating. 
But if you are going to be self-treating, some basic rules that I suggest for safety are one, to research a new herb and at least three good resources. So getting a variety of perspectives on what that plant does, what it doesn't do, what its cautions may be. You'll learn little different things from different sources. So it's nice to get a couple different perspectives. I usually like to include one that's science-based and then the rest of them be more herbalist written because the herbalists usually have a lot more nuance and a deeper understanding of the plants, but I like knowing where the science is at too, if if there is science. And for tonight's, for tonight's topic, there's a fair amount of science available on a lot of these plants. Um, and if you go on my website, I do have under the learn more tab, a recommended reading page for a lot of my favorite books, as well as a links page. And on the links page, you can find both science-based as well as herbalist written resources on herbs for free that are available online. So you don't necessarily need to buy books. They're, they're fun to have in the library. <laughs> Obviously I'm a fan of books, um, but you, there are a lot of really great resources online. There are also a lot of not so great resources online. And I used to run the fact checking department at Natural Health Magazine, and I have a background as a journalist. So I'm kind of a stickler for good quality sources. So I give you some good tips on those web pages. Equally important to doing that research is listening to your body, listening to your intuition. Um, what herbs are you drawn to that just kind of feel like they might be right for you? And then simultaneously, once you start to actually take them, pay attention. Like, how does this feel? Do you feel better? Especially when it comes to the topic of sleep. Are you falling asleep better? Is your quality of sleep better? When you wake up in the morning, do you feel better when you wake up? Like you got a better night's rest. Sometimes the opposite happens. Sometimes, especially if somebody has maybe sleep apnea and they start to take a lot of sedating herbs, that could make the sleep apnea worse. And so you may feel like maybe you're sleeping better, but you're waking up feeling more groggy that's usually a sign that the herb is not the right plant for you, for example. Um, and just kind of paying attention to how that feels. It might feel different in your body that from one to another. And those body signals are going to be what's going to help you decide what ultimately is, ultimately is right for you. And I would recommend starting with a low dose and gradually sort of working your way up so that you can gauge the response. Sometimes you can get away with having a desired response with a much lower dose than's recommended, which is awesome. And sometimes it turns out the plant's not right for you. And that's better to find out at a low dose than a high dose. So that's my suggestion. If you're doing any harvesting of your plants, you're gonna to wanna to ensure the identity 100%. And so don't even take for granted what somebody put on a label in a garden center. You know, Go online, pull up botanical descriptions and photos and make sure that you know what it is. If it was a wild plant, which really isn't what we're covering today, but if you're working with wild plants, you'd wanna have a field identification guide and to really hone that skill of identifying your plants. And even when you're purchasing plants, it's important to have really good quality sources. And so places like your local co-op, as well as getting things directly from an herb farm, and then ultimately growing and making your own things, those are some of the better quality resources. I, I wouldn't get things on Amazon. There's actually been a big issue with even good quality products being adulterated on Amazon and people running into problems. And I get like, I love Amazon. It's convenient, but I... Unfortunately, it's no longer a safe place to buy supplements and herbs. And uh, and then just know that like the mass market usually also isn't the best quality places like the big box stores. Last but not least, and a really big one, especially for tonight's topic, is double checking about um, herb drug interactions. So if you're on any pharmaceuticals, if you can, you know, obviously let your doctor know what you want to take. Um, simultaneously, it's a good thing to check in with your pharmacist. And they usually do have really good databases that they can check things in. That said, I, I know some really wonderful pharmacists and they are so busy these days. I mean, there's been a lot put on their plate and staffing shortages. So they may not always have as much time to do that digging. So if you do go to your pharmacist, you maybe try to pick a time of day that's a little bit quieter to see if they're available to do some digging and see if there might be an herb drug interaction. If you're working with a holistic practitioner, usually we will do that digging for you. And uh, there are a few resources on my website that will give you some idea of some of the herb drug interactions on the links page, but not a ton that's on there. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of really great free um, resources out there on that. 
So, and the big one to be aware of for tonight's talk is that with those sedating herbs, so the herbs that we often think of for sleep, if you're taking them alongside medications that also are relaxant or sedating, they could have a synergizing effect and end up making you more relaxed and more sedated, which might not be a bad thing. You know, maybe you were a, a bit anxious still with your medication and now you're like less anxious, or maybe you were sleeping kind of meh and now you're sleeping better. That's good, good synergy. But if it means that you fell asleep at the wheel or that maybe you had apnea and now it's a lot worse, or that your breathing, your respiration was being depressed, or your heart rate or your blood pressure was being depressed and you fainted. Um, you know, these things don't happen often, but it is a potential or drug interaction with those more sedating plants alongside sleep medications, anxiety medications, other, you know, psych and mental health um, medications. Some of the pain medications also are more sedating, just to give a couple examples. So I'll do a little bit of a background, but mostly we're going to focus on the herbs tonight. So why does sleep matter? I mean, sleep is such a core part of our foundational health. And, you know, in the herbal world, we often view sleep as one of those pillars. I think not just herbal, I mean, most of medicine and all the different holistic and conventional modalities recognize that when we go to good night's sleep, our health is so much better. And if we are not getting a quality sleep, if we're shirking on the amount of time that we're in bed, or if we're just, you know, maybe we are trying to get a good night's sleep, but it's not really sticking, um, that does have some various negative effects on the body. So, you know, some of the good things that sleep will do for us when we're getting good quality sleep, we're getting both a really nice nervous system response from that, as well as a really good adrenal and um, hormonal aspect from it. And so we are going to be more in that parasympathetic, relax, rest and digest, rest and repair nervous system response. And so we'll have more relaxation, especially as we sleep. It gives our body a chance to like work through the crud of the day. You know, we've got deep sleep to be more restorative and repair the body and detoxify the body. And then we've got those REM cycles when we're having our dreams to work through sort of like the emotional and just all the all the input that we get in during the day, our brain works through in those more like dream states as well. And so we have these mix of different sleep cycles throughout the night and each one has its own important role. And so we're gonna do a lot of our wound repair, a lot of our just like, if you think of, you know, a city at night and, you know, the street cleaners are out there cleaning up the street and, you know, things are just happening so that when we awake the next morning, things are just a little bit brighter and spiffier. And that's kind of what happens in our body when we're sleeping. We get better immune function when we get a good quality sleep. We have better digestion um, during the day, especially when we get a good night's sleep. And we also have that detoxification. They found that when we're in our deep sleep state, our brain has these lymphatic um, cells, the lymphatic system, and they actually help clean like crud out of our brain while we're in a deep sleep state is the main time that happens. And so if we're not getting a good quality sleep, that's one of a couple different reasons why you might just feel a little bit more like hungover and groggy the next day. It's like, there's literally a little bit more crud floating around your brain the next day. Um, so the getting that deeper sleep and, and getting a longer night sleep of closer to that seven or eight hours is helpful because you get the most deep sleep in those last few hours usually. We get a little bit throughout, but the, the phases of deep sleep tend to be longer in those later cycles. We get more blood flow to the periphery. You know, when we're in stress mode, our body like wants to go to the big muscles and also to the core, but less to like the fingers and toes. So when we're relaxed, we get more of that. We get better mood, better sleep quality, better blood sugar control. Um, the studies have shown that even just a little bit of not sleeping well can start to affect our appetite, our blood sugar metabolism, our hunger hormones, our insulin resistance. Um, all of those things start to kind of like add up. The more we don't sleep, we start to create, you know, just one night of not sleeping well, we tend to crave more um, high reward foods and not necessarily nutrient dense foods. We usually have better mind body balance when we're sleeping. We have a reduced risk of a lot of chronic diseases and inflammation. Our hormone balance in general tends to be better. Our cognitive well-being tends to be better. 
So just a few studies, um, they found that when folks got less than six hours of sleep per night, that they were three times more likely to get sick from the common cold. And so they, they took everybody and swabbed them with the rhinovirus, the common cold, and the folks who didn't sleep as well were three times more likely to actually get sick from that. Um, some of the studies on metabolism, you know, folks who were sleeping about five hours per night versus seven to nine were generally going to eat about 500 or more calories per day and crave more and choose of some of those like less healthy foods, those high reward foods that there were even changes in the brain where the brain would light up more when you'd see like say a donut or chips versus folks who were sleeping more appropriately through the night. And then that would, of course, lead to the sleep deprivation would lead to weight gain and the hunger hormones themselves would start to get altered where we wouldn't feel as satiated when we weren't getting a good night's sleep. Junk food tastes better when we're not sleeping well. I can totally attest to that. When I'm not sleeping well, I am definitely wanting, you know, cookies and things that I don't normally eat. And when I eat it, it's super exciting. So I, uh, I can definitely see in my own body the, the reality of a lot of what they show in the studies. Um, even, um, 7.7 hours per night is associated with weight gain over time. So get versus like eight hours of night of sleep per night. But usually most folks will say like seven to nine is a good general, um, guideline to go for blood sugar balance. As I mentioned, also tends to be better when we're sleeping well, tends to get worse. So for each 30 minutes that you don't sleep at night, there's a 41% increased risk of insulin resistance over the course of the coming year. And insulin resistance being what sets us, sets us up for um, prediabetes and diabetes. Heart disease, we tend to see all different types of heart disease get more aggravated with sleep deprivation and poor sleep quality, cognition and focus, and so on and so on. So that's like the, the good news from that sleeping well improves all those things. And the bad news of like, oh, shoot, I'm not sleeping well. So, you know, now we're going to panic about all these things. Um, so we're going to try to use this information as my colleague, Tammy Sweet would say, let's use this information for good and inspire us to just really try to focus in on our quality sleep, but also not letting a bad night's sleep create additional stress if we can, you know, just being forgiving of our bodies and trying to support them as much as possible to gradually shift in that direction. So we can take a quality approach to sleep and keeping in mind that we should have hormones, you know, ideally we have these sleep wake cycles and our wake hormone is cortisol, which is one of our stress hormones. And our sleep hormone is predominantly melatonin. And we respond to these hormones in part based off of what's happening with the daylight. So when we start to see that little, like little bit of daylight start to creep in in the early morning, that cortisol, it's going to go up a little bit and that helps wake us up and give us the energy for the day. And then around midday, it's going to start to gradually wane down. And as it gets darker, the melatonin starts to kick in more. You probably know this already. Um, but how we react to the lights around us, like right now I have like two very bright LED, actually three very bright LEDs on my face and a computer screen and another computer screen. That's not really good for sleep because it's telling my body, Hey, you know what? It's noon or it's morning. It's really bright out. And that resets my entire sleep cycle and makes it so that the melatonin isn't going to kick in until quite a bit later. So we can do a lot with supporting our sleep just by determining how we're going to interact with the light around us, giving ourselves more sunlight or bright light during the daytime, the morning and midday, and then purposefully starting to like shift those screens down, put on like blue light blocking apps or glasses as we get, or just dim and then shut down screens altogether as we get into the evening, you know, after tonight. <laughs> I know you're all here online right now for this class, unless you're catching the recording. So having that interaction with the light and just remembering that that is something that resets our sleep and wake cycles, and we can use that to our benefit, or it can end up being to our disadvantage. And the blue light in particular that we tend to get from screens and artificial lights tends to be one of the more problematic types of lights, uh, unfortunately. So, but you can still shift that a little bit. Cortisol you know, not only is it a wake hormone, but it is also of just like a normal, healthy, you know, we need some cortisol. It's an important hormone for our well-being, our safety, our survival, the function of our body. 
but we want it to be happening in the right amounts in the right curve during the day. And we also get cortisol surges when our blood sugar gets low, when our blood sugar gets high and then crashes also will surge our cortisol. Because another thing that cortisol does is it, um, it tells our body when our blood sugar is low, that like, oh shoot, we need, we need fuel. So let's pull sugar out of storage and put it in the bloodstream because the blood sugar is low. And sometimes the blood sugar is low because of an overreactivity to a bunch of glucose coming in and then it crashes and then it gets too low. So we end up on these unpleasant roller coasters instead of these more gradual, you know, baby roller coasters. We're on the big, scary ones. So that's one other time we see cortisol when we're just in stress mode, our cortisol tends to go up because it thinks like, oh, we need, we need fuel. We need energy to fight the saber tooth tiger or run from it. And so when we're in stress mode, we'll tend to see more of those stress hormones getting released. And then also other times throughout the middle of the night, you know, if people are having a hot flash, there is a surge of um, adrenaline and cortisol that will get emitted during that time. So like perimenopause, postmenopause both with hot flashes, as well as just kind of the general state of hormonal being when there's less estrogen and progesterone in the body usually allows for like higher levels of cortisol. Um, if our blood sugar is doing those roller coasters. And then also if we have apnea and we're not getting oxygen at night, cortisol is the hormone that helps our body survive. And it says there's danger, wake up. <laughs> You're not getting oxygen. You need oxygen. And you may or may not be even aware of it. Sometimes people who are getting up in the middle of the night to pee, they're getting up because of those cortisol sur surges a lot of times because their body gets the cortisol surge and it thinks, oh, it's morning. <laughs> Let's go to the bathroom and get the day started. And so you get up to go pee and then you wait, get back to bed and you're like, bing. Um, so there's a lot that goes around cortisol. And the cool part of this is that even though there are all these different things that raise our cortisol levels, if we start to incorporate different things that help us relax, help us with our stress management, maybe it's deep breathing, maybe it's yoga, maybe it's a relaxing herb. And you know, there are a lot of different ways that we can support our stress levels. Um, the more that we start to do that day and night, the better most of those things get. Now with sleep apnea, you'll need to address the sleep apnea usually with a CPAP machine. But with a lot of the other things, just by managing our stress levels has a tremendous impact on the body. And then that also has a tremendous impact on our sleep. So some basic tips, um, trying to support our stress response so that we have a healthier stress response and with reason, don't stress out about having stress, but you know, the more that we can do, it really does have a profound impact. Um, trying to limit our evening stimulation, which can be coming in the form of like TV, entertainment, that's really exciting. Um, too much vigor, you know, exercise is good for us, but exercise late at night can sometimes be a little bit stimulating. So some exercise is better than no exercise, but if you can do it like earlier in the evening or during the daytime or in the morning, those are usually better times to do exercise from a sleep wake cycle perspective. Um, even supplements like your multivitamin B vitamins, um, some of the adaptogens and other herbs, you know, a lot of formulas have energizing herbs in them. And if you're having those later in the day, even that could be something that's kind of help keeping you awake a little bit more. And I will say, you know, a lot of my clients, I'm postmenopausal. A lot of my clients are peri and postmenopausal. We tend to become more sensitive to those stimulants as we get older and especially as we go through our, those hormonal shifts. So even if you could get away with it previously in your life, you may not be able to get away with it anymore. Um, drugs, um, both pharmaceuticals as well as recreational drugs can sometimes have effect. Um, caffeine, we did a program years ago at the co-op on spontaneous happiness. And we had about 50 people tried all sorts of different things. Uh, the two things throughout that series that the people found the most help with was one, a deep breathing exercise, the four, seven, eight breath. And then the other one was cutting back caffeine like that. Those two things made a profound impact in the quality of people's day and nighttime stress levels, as well as their quality of sleep. Working, screen time, um, also other things like eating or drinking, having a big meal late at night, um, lots of snacks late at night. Those things can change both our, um, our sleep-wake cycles as well as our blood sugar levels. Um, alcohol, even just one or two glasses of alcohol can be enough to disrupt sleep, again, especially 
as we get older and especially as we go through hormonal shifts. So keeping that in mind and trying to limit the consumption instead, maybe have a small cup of tea or a seltzer or something like that, that is not going to be quite so stimulating. Having that relationship with light, as we were talking about before, and then just creating a nice like little wind down routine for yourself. You know, maybe it's some yoga nidra or deep breathing. Maybe it's reading a good book with only like a little, you know, a little night light that goes over the book versus, you know, lots of really bright lights. Um, maybe it's a bath, maybe it's, you know, some sort of yin yoga or, you know, just lots of different ways. So whatever feels good for you as part of your sort of wind down routine at night can be really, really helpful. We do it with kids. And then we forget that we're just big kids. Like our bodies also really like that routine and like that, that ritual of telling our body, like, this is what time of day it is. We're not at work anymore. It's time for time for us to unwind and go to bed. In the bedroom, keeping things low or no tech, dark, cool, quiet, calming, comforting, you know, make that sleep sanctuary for yourself if you possibly can. And if you need to, I mean, I love my eye mask and my earplugs. Like I'm definitely somebody who easily has problems sleeping. And so I've been able to work with a lot of these things. This is, this was my own introduction to herbal medicine was in college, having a traumatic event and then having insomnia uh, and panic attacks. And so some of the first herbs I ever worked with were herbs that support it. And they were so profoundly helpful and uh, still remain a very large part of my home apothecary are those stress and relaxation herbs. Um, having socks on, having heavy blankets, but not so heavy that you're overheating in the middle of the night, maybe some blackout curtains, you know, whatever it is for you that's accessible for you and that works for you to make that, you know, quality sleep time. And let's see. There we go into the herbs. So we doing okay over there? I guess my got it over here. We're good. Awesome. Cool. Um, all right. So going into some of my favorite sleep herbs, and I'm gonna pause and sip because I know I'm talking kind of fast as I normally do, but I know I'm talking particularly fast tonight. So some basic botanical medicine reminders: herbs are a really wonderful tool in the toolkit. They are awesome way to support our health. Um, they do work best alongside the bigger picture. So healthy diet, exercise, lifestyle habits, deep breathing, you know, all, all that good stuff. Um, the herbs are really, I think of them as sort of training wheels to help nudge our body into that better state. Sometimes we need a little something to help us with that paradigm shift, but we do want to also be doing some, at least some of that deeper work of figuring out what's going to be most impactful for you and addressing it. Because I do find that if, you know, there's usually a reason why somebody isn't sleeping. And if you're not also addressing that, then eventually the wor the herbs might stop working for you because your body is like, hey, I told you, <laughs> like, I don't like what you're doing. Don't just keep giving me this herb and be like, it's all okay. Just, you know, really listen to your body and see where are things out of balance? And is it possible for you to address that to some extent? And over time, that's what's going to make the really big difference but the herbs really are helpful for just kind of helping to break some of those patterns and create those new healthier patterns. And the herbs have personalities. You know, every herb is a little bit different in exactly what it does and how it tastes and how it responds in the body and its energetics and what are its side effects and cautions. And, you know, every herb is just a little different. And so get to know like, who's your friend and who's your ally. Some herbs really resonate more with one person or another. And so you'll start to guess that just by learning about them, but then it's going to be when you actually try them and take them, it's how your body responds to those herbs. That's ultimately going to let you know which herbs, which herbs are your closest friends and are going to be the best, um, the best partnerships for you. Quality and freshness matters a lot. So um, these are herbs that really do degrade very quickly, especially if they're not well handled. The herbs we're going to focus on tonight are the ones that are more common in commerce and that are commonly found in commerce and can be found in good quality. But, you know, things can really vary from company to company. And so just because something didn't work, um, it might be that it was just not a really potent format that you were trying, or it could be that there's a different remedy or a different dose that works better for you. Most of these herbs do have some immediate effects. You might notice a difference that very neat same night in how you feel. You know, a lot of them hit the system pretty quickly, but there's also a building effect with time. So 
you may notice that as time goes on, that the, the quality continues to improve, especially if you're also doing at least some of those bigger things. And one of the things I like about herbs is sometimes they help us do some of those bigger things. When your life is in an imbalanced state, sometimes everything feels really overwhelming because you're stressed, you're overwhelmed, you're exhausted. Um, but then if you can just get that like one or two good night's sleep or a little bit better sleep, you wake up feeling a little bit more capable. And so it's, then it's easier to make the healthy food choices that then feed the positive sleep patterns and, you know, things kind of continually improve. So there is a sort of long-term building effect with time as well. And some of the herbs we're going to focus on this chart is in um, my first book, Body into Balance. And so we have like stimulants, high caffeine plants over here. That's not what we're recommending today. Um, we have some of our adaptogens, which are kind of stimulating in a way. Um, and so we've got some of the more stimulating ones They have a place, but for the most part, I would not recommend those. And then we get to some of the more gentle-ish adaptogens, our nervines, which are our nervous system restoratives that just kind of nourish and support the nervous system, herbs that are a little bit more calming, and then going into the ones that are a little bit more sedating. And so we're going to focus a little bit more on this more like strongly relaxing and sedating level. So I am going to leave this slide here, but basically all these herbs work really well as tinctures, which are your alcohol liquid extracts. You can also get some pretty cool phyto caps. Um, I do really love that. I have no commercial ties to, I mean, I do some stuff with the co-op, but I'm not like really financially compensated for that. And I, I have a lot of companies I like and some I don't like, um, but I don't have any financial ties to any of them. And I will say that Gaia is a company that I really like their liquid capsules, um, there's a really cool company in New Hampshire called Mega Food. They make really good products. Um, there are some really great local companies. Um, so there are a lot of really great companies out there, Urban Moonshine. I don't remember exactly what the co-op carries these days, but I would say usually whatever they have at the co-op is going to be a pretty good quality. And uh, I will say that of like the commonly available herb companies, Gaia is usually one of my top choices, especially for capsules of herbs. Um, there's some other great companies like Organs Wild Harvest and, and many others too. I used to run the, the co-ops supplement department. So I know what we had back in my day, but I'm less familiar with the, cause nowadays I make my own stuff. So I'm not as often in the uh, health and beauty aisles there. I'm usually in their produce aisles and their bulk aisle when I'm in there shopping, but you can make all sorts of remedies. Some of them do make really nice teas. And some of the ones that we're going to cover today do actually make really lovely teas. And then you can do all sorts of other things with them as well some basic dosing. And then I do have, if you do like making remedies, I have a remedy making 101 blog post that you can check out with deeper recipes. So we've got our sedatives and relaxants. Those are the main ones we're going to focus on. There are other herbs that are more calming, but less sedating. Those are nice day or night. And then adaptogens and energizing herbs, if you work with them, usually more of a daytime thing to help sort of with those sleep wake cycles. But in some people, they tolerate them well, and some people don't. All right, so sedatives. I already gave most of my cautions. Let's see, is there anything else? So be aware that sedatives can aggravate sleep apnea. So if you have sleep apnea, if you have a CPAP machine, you should be fine. But if you have sleep, sleep apnea and you either don't know it or, you, um, or you're, you're just choosing not to use your CPAP machine, I wouldn't really recommend the sedatives. I might go for the milder herbs, like maybe lemon balm or holy basil that are relaxing, but not overly sedating. You may have a better luck with that, but I'd also really recommend having the sleep apnea address because you'll probably sleep a lot better once you adapt to the machinery. Um, also, some sleep disorders don't respond as well to the stronger sedatives, especially sleep paralysis. It's not a very common sleep disorder, but just know these don't always agree with everybody. Um, occasionally, people find that their depression gets aggravated with a more sedating plant. It's very hit or miss. It's usually like with one herb, but not another, and it's very individual. But just know that if you're starting to feel kind of like you're more in a funk with an herb, then it's probably not the right herb for you. You might want something a little less sedating and more of like a nervine, gentler relaxant or an uplifting herb. Um, some people will find these herbs too sedating for daytime use. It depends on the person. Um, I've met, you know, tall strapping young men who returned a box of chamomile tea because they had one tea bag of tea and they felt like they couldn't wake up for a couple of days. 
um, that was a pretty extreme response. A lot of people can drink chamomile tea with their lunch and be totally fine. So really listen to your body here. Um, and then we already talked about the medications, cautions and all that. So I think we covered that. So first things first is valerian. And this is the first herb that I ever worked with when I was having my own sleep issues back in college. And it really did work so well for me. I mean, I, I felt like I, I would fall asleep better. I would get a deeper rest. I would wake up feeling rested. It was really a, a pretty magical plant for me, but it's not magical for everybody. So um, so I would really listen to your body with this. If you are going to work with valerian, just try a little bit first and know that people are kind of quirky with valerian. So valerian, the research is mixed, but what the research seems to suggest is it helps people most with falling asleep. Um, it's also a little bit of a muscle relaxer. So if you are somebody with kind of tense muscles or pain due to tense muscles, valerian might help with that as well as helping with relaxing the nervous system to help you sleep. It tends to be a little bit more specific for people who are more on the anxious side, people who maybe are on the, like, you know, if you have the, the different body types, the folks who tend to be a little bit thinner, folks who tend to run cold, um, usually that's the constitution that does well with valerian. Valerian is kind of a warming, building sort of herb. So if somebody's already kind of warm and anabolic, um, valerian can sometimes be more irritating for those folks. So I think of like, you know, your motorcycle, you know, your stereotypical motorcycle um, guy, you know, that's the kind of personality that sometimes doesn't do very well with valerian. So when people don't do well with valerian, usually what ends up happening is that they start to actually feel agitated, almost like they had a cup of coffee and it's not super common, but it's somewhat common. So I would just be aware, like what kind of person are you? And you might be the Valerian kind of person. And those are just general rules of thumb because, you know, even in our own house, I'm the cold one. My husband is the hot one. Um, most people find that they are in, if they're in a pairing that one person is cold as one person is hot, because if you have two hot people, you'll burst into flames in the middle of the night. And if you have two cold people, you'll die as an ice cube. So usually you have a little bit of both. Um, and so he's a hot person, but he actually does okay with Valerian too. So, you know, it, it's not a, it's not a hard and fast rule, but as a general rule of thumb, you might want to think of that. Um, it does smell funny. So if you've ever worked with valerian before, it's got kind of this funky, perfumey, dirt, skunky, stinky feet kind of aroma to it. I remember taking some before bed um, years ago when I was with somebody else that I was dating at the time. And uh, as I turned over, he's like, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. I smell so bad. I should have showered. And I was like, oh dude, that's not you. That's me. <laughs> I just took valerian. So it's got kind of a funky smell to it. Um, some people do make tea with it. It does you know, it's a funky smell, especially as a dry plant. So most people are not going to love the taste of it as a tea, but the people who do form a deep relationship with it, I have met people who love valerian as tea because they just associate that smell with a good quality sleep. So you can certainly have it as tea, but I usually prefer it as a fresh root, as a tincture. That's the way I tend to work with it the most often. And it tends to work really nicely that way for the people that it works for. It's pretty easy to grow. Um, it will even take over garden beds. Uh, I, I, I've been called in by a couple different organic farmers over the years to come and, and dig up valerian root that was taking over their garden. And I literally filled my trunk with plants and they looked at me and said, is that all you're taking? <laughs> because this plant will self-seed and just take over really rich, good quality soil, like your farmlands, your organic farms. They really love that. Um, I've had it in my garden. It was never invasive, but I also had sandy kind of cruddy soil. So I just had some in my bed and it, it was pretty basic. The flowers actually smell really nice. You can also work with the flower essence of valerian is also lovely for deep sleep and relaxation. And, uh, but th those roots are kind of fun. And so when you're pulling them up, they're not that deep in the soil. So a lot of times you can just kind of grab the plants up together and sort of pull a bunch out at once. And then clean them off. Look for earthworms. The earthworms love to hang out in here. <laughs> they like the same kind of soil. So just make sure that you're not tincturing any earthworms. And then you can make your own tincture or you can buy it. There are a lot of really great companies that make it. So that's valerian. Let's see, we're going till 7.30, I believe. 
So I do have a moment. Does anybody have any questions about Valerian? You can unmute yourself and ask, or you can plug it in the chat box. And if anybody's in the process of typing, I'll just talk for a moment. Um, so if you are taking it as a tincture, you know, for most of these herbs, what I would do as a tincture, those are your liquid alcohol extracts. I would take like one or two squirts of your dropper. One squirt of a dropper is about a milliliter, a little less than a milliliter. And you can put it in a little bit of water to dilute it, like a little shot glass, take it. If you hold it in your mouth for a little bit, that'll get into your bloodstream a little faster. But really the nice thing about tinctures is they get into the bloodstream pretty quickly either way. And so I would start with once, you know, start with a few drops just to try it out. But normal dose is usually anywhere between one and five squirts of the tincture. And then if you wake up in the middle of the night, you can keep the tincture bottle and a, a glass of water by your bedside and take like a smaller dose because sometimes you just need to kind of chill your brain back out again if you do wake up. And valerian does work nicely. It actually doesn't stick in your system for very long, usually just a couple hours. And so as long as you don't take a really big dose in the middle of the night, usually people will be okay by the time morning comes. Um, so that's your typical tincture dose for pills. I would just follow the, the label starting with one pill and then working up to maybe a higher dose if you need it. And for tea, it's usually like a heaping teaspoon or so in your hot water. And if you're making a tea for bedtime, I would do a small cup and just brew it really strong. And if you need to add a little honey or something to it to make it taste better, that's totally okay. And, uh, and so, but if you make a really big cup of tea that might make you need to pee in the middle of the night. So just make kind of a small, strong one. That said, there is something about the ritual of a cup of tea that is relaxing and kind of nice after dinner. Let's see, we do have a couple of questions. Yeah, let's see. So Kiki asks, would you combine it with something or use it on its own? So great question. So any of these herbs can be combined together. So there are a lot of great combo formulas. You could also work with them as simples or single herbs as well. Sometimes it's nice as you're getting to know a plant, if you're really wanting to form a deeper relationship with the herbs to start with one plant so you can kind of get to know your relationship and how your body responds to individuals. But formulas are great too, because you'll hit things from a couple different angles. And so there's no one right answer for everybody. Um, usually it just comes from trying it, seeing if it works for you. But I remember years ago uh, working at a different natural food store and they, uh, we had a couple of us who were into the stress relieving herbs and we each had our own favorite product, even within the same brand company, you know, one, you know, one of us liked holy basil, one of us liked rhodiola, somebody else liked the combo blend, like everybody's a little bit different. And all of us were like, yeah, that other one's not that great, but this one, this one's my best one. Um, so sometimes it's learning about the plants and seeing what, you know, on paper seems like the best match for you. And then actually trying them out and seeing what, what the best match for you. And as you start to know what the different herbs do, you'll be able to look at those formula blends and be like, Ooh, like, I kind of like these ones. You're like, I don't know about that one. Um, and you can maybe assess those formulas a little better and find the right one for you. Let's see, question from Susan. Um, I used to be the cold person, but not since menopause. I am hot, um, should I avoid this one? So it's completely up to you, but you may find it a little bit more agitating because we do tend to start to run a little bit hotter after menopause. So you could try it out, but there might be other ones that we'll get to that might actually be a better match, like maybe passion flower, which is a little bit more cooling. Uh, let's see, Betsy asked, and hopefully I'm pronouncing everybody's names correctly. I took valerian years ago as dry capsules and I felt nothing, maybe because it was not a tincture. Um, I do personally think that the, the fresh plant, the fresh root in a tincture has got a lot more oomph and vibrancy to it, but it may have been the dose. It may have been the quality of the encapsulated product. It may have also just been that it wasn't the right plant for you. Um, so there are a variety of reasons. And, you know, there's a lot that we can do intellectually, but then ultimately it's kind of just seeing, um, seeing what works for you and starting with a small amount so that you can, you know, you don't want to spend lots of money buying a bazillion bottles, but, you know, see if you can get a small amount, see how it is. And then once you figure out kind of your go-to herbs, then you can stock up, if you will. Uh, let's see. Kiki says, also happened to um, Kiki. This is a super popular in the 90s. I think I had not had a good quality herb, so maybe tincture or reliable source to retry now. I will also say, so although we're starting with valerian because it's the most popular, most 
um, most researched herb for sleep, it is not the strongest herb for sleep. And even in the studies, there were a lot of very unimpressive results in the studies when it came to sleep compared to some of the other herbs that we're going to get to shortly. So it is not necessarily the best herb for everybody, but for some people, it is pretty amazing, especially if it's a good quality herb and it's the right match. Um, somebody else had tea and was up most of the night. Um, have I ever had an experience with it stimulating a patient? So yeah, well, I don't have patients. I have clients cause I'm not a doctor, but, um, semantics aside. Yes. Um, as I was saying before, valerian is quirky and there are some people who do get stimulated like a cup of caffeine, um, from valerian. So that is a not entirely uncommon response to valerian for some people. So, um, so that the good news is, is that most of the other herbs don't have that quirkiness to it. It's really valerian's the biggie there. Can I ask you, um, why that might be, what constituent would be in the plant that would be stimulating? That's a great question. I don't have an exact answer, but the theory is, is that there is some kind of a constituent in there, whether it's the valerianic acid or something else that, some people's bodies maybe don't metabolize very well and it ends up having a, a more stimulating effect on them. I don't, we don't really know for sure though. And nobody's really researched that as far as I know. It's just, but it is definitely a phenomenon that happens. Um, you could also wonder like, because it is a heating herb, it might just be too heating. Like that's sort of like excess heat kind of energetic going on. But, um, but yeah, it does happen with some people, but we have other herbs. So we should probably move on to those. But those are all great questions and comments too. So passion flowers is a good corollary because one, I love passion flower. It's such a great plant. It's definitely over the years became one of my big go-tos for sleep. You know, I started off working with valerian a lot in my early days. And then especially as I started reading more of the research on passion flower, I started giving it more of a try. So there is not as much research. There aren't as many human studies that have been done on passion flower as valerian. That said, I think things are changing because there were a lot more studies being done just in the last few years. And um, But what it has been done on humans for passion flower has been very well received. Most of the studies have shown really tremendous benefits. A lot of times passion flower has worked as well as the benzodiazepine drugs that they were comparing them to, um, whether it was being worked with for sleep or for anxiety or something like that, sleep and anxiety being the two biggies. And, uh, and so that's pretty impressive. I'm not saying that it can replace your medications. That's something you'd want to work with your doctor and it may not always pan out, but I am saying that the studies suggested that it was relatively comparable or almost as potent and, um, has fewer side effects because those medications can be actually quite, um, quite addictive. And for the sleep side of things, people do get a better night's sleep but they don't get as much deep sleep. It's not quite as much about like a real and restful sleep. So whereas passion flower doesn't seem to have those negative side effects, which is kind of nice. It's a more across the board herb. So in my clinic, um, I do find that more people respond positively to passion flower. Most people, if they have it, are going to feel calmer and are going to have a better night's sleep. Some people can take it during the daytime for anxiety and just calm during the day. And some people that will make them too sleepy and they only you know, want it at nighttime. It's done really well in formulas. So one of the best studies that they did on valerian that had the most impressive results and it worked as well as one of the sleep medications in that particular study, it wasn't just valerian, it was valerian hops and passion flower. And there were other studies on just valerian hops okay, like better than the valerian only studies, but it was the valerian hops passion flower study that had the more impressive results. And then there are lots of other studies on just the individual passion flower as a tea. And you don't necessarily need a super big dose of it. Like one of the tea studies, it was just like maybe like one teaspoon steeped for 15 minutes. Um, and that was really helpful for insomnia for it. So you know, it's one of the key herbs that I'll put into a sleep tea blend. And it, it tastes okay. It's not great tasting, but it's not bad tasting. So it's really easy to put with other herbs. So I usually combine it with like spearmint and a little bit of honey, maybe some holy basil or other herbs. And, uh, and you can make a really nice tasting bedtime or relaxing tea. Um, there are some other really nice studies on four weeks. That was the one that found it comparable. The GAD is generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, we're not allowed to treat diseases, but this is what the study found was that it was um, comparable to one of the common um, relaxant medications with fewer side effects. 
And, uh, and so it's just a really nice, you know, the energy of this plant is like calm, cool, relax, chill out. Um, if people have a lot of like mind chatter, this is an herb that one of the herbs that's really good for kind of quelling that down a little bit. Um, it's also really nice when people are like in excess, like any of the body systems that are in overdrive or um, hot states, it's really nice for relaxing those two. I would still use it in somebody who was cold, but I would particularly think of it in somebody who was on the hotter side that this just kind of relaxes things. You know, if your digestive system or your cardiovascular system is really like worked up, this is an herb that can relax that a little bit. Um, so a really nice plant, you can take it in any form, dry, fresh, tincture, um, pill, uh, tea, you know, it really is pretty adaptable for a lot of different formats. It's pretty easy to get decent quality dried in commerce. Uh, I don't know for sure if the co-op has it in bulk, but I'm sure that they have it in some, at least some of their formulas, if not solo. Um, I didn't get a chance to check their stock before this class, but um, but I'm sure they have it. And you can also find it elsewhere too. So um, pretty nicer, but it is sedating. So all the usual sedative, um, sedative cautions apply to all these plants. Are there any questions and comments on passionflower? Do you have any um, experience with its creating more dopamine? Is that something? Because I've heard it either be serotonergic or dopaminergic. Ooh, that's a good question. I am not aware of what its effects on serotonin and dopamine. I mostly hear of it being GABAergic. So helping with uh, most of these tend to be kind of GABAergic. So GABA being one of our... Um, it's a neurotransmitter um, that is more of like our relaxing. So if we have this sort of stimulating like adrenaline and epinephrine and noradrenaline, you know, some of the hormones and neurotransmitters that are more stimulating, um, GABA, G-A-B-A is one of the ones that tends to relax and kind of sedate our central nervous system. And passion flower is more of a GABAergic herb. But as far as its effects on dopamine and serotonin, um, I'm not as aware of that. I don't think of it as a, a serotonin herb for sure. I don't think of any of these as being major serotonin herbs. There are other herbs I think of for those. Um, it may have a little bit of an MAOI inhibiting kind of action or an MAOI action, but it's really like, there's really not a lot of research on that side of it. And as far as dopamine, I don't know. Um, have I had any luck growing it? Yes and no. Actually this, um, plant over here in the background. That is the Passiflora incarnata. And that picture is, um, if not that same plant, another plant that I had growing in my yard in a previous year. So you can grow it in New Hampshire, but it doesn't survive the winters. And so because of that, it's hard to plant it in the ground. And because of that, um, you know, you don't get the big, like in the Southwest and the, sorry, the Southeast, it's more of a Floridian kind of plant. Um, and it's so gorgeous. Um, it really can take over. Like it just, it's this sort of vine ish kind of plant that just keeps kind of traveling over everything. But here in New Hampshire, like you can get it, but it's hard to get a lot of it. That said, I mean, if I wanted to, I could cut that whole plant back and dry it or tincture it or something like that. And I'd get like a fair size jar of it. Um, it is not one where you can just interchangeably use any species. You really want this Passiflora incarnata. And there are a lot of other ornamental passion flower plants out there that um, may not have the same relaxing effect and may even be a little bit toxic. And so if you're going to get Passiflora incarnata, that's one that I would get through the mail from a company that specializes in medicinal plants. So strictly medicinal seeds, cells, fresh plants through the mail as a potted plant, and then um, companion plants is another one. So those would be two that I would trust, but I wouldn't trust any old garden center. Um, even there was a garden center a while back that specialized in herbs down in Massachusetts and mostly were great, but even they weren't, you know, I said, is this a passion flower? And the employee wasn't well educated <laughs> and like, oh, that's the one. And then later I went home and did digging because I hadn't grown it before. And I was like, wait a minute, this is not the right species. Um, so you really don't want to just get it from any greenhouse. You want to get it from um, a special place. Let's see. I read about pea flower or butterfly flower. Um, I could be wrong in the verbiage. Do they have the same effects? So I do love butterfly blue pea flower for teas. It's like, it's really cool, very blue flower that dyes everything like super cool purpley pink kind of color. Um, I 
but it's not. And I've read that it's relaxing. I don't feel like it's that relaxing of a plant um, and they're not related at all. So I don't think they have the same chemistry or the same activity. I mostly work with butterfly blue pea flower when I want to make things look pretty in blue or purple. Um, I'm sure it's antioxidant rich. If you get the non-medicinal species, is it the host for the Gulf fritillary butterfly? I am not super great with bugs, but I think it might be, but I am not 100% sure. I have not noticed a whole lot of um, caterpillars on my passion flowers, so I'm, I don't really know. You might grow other passion flowers for other reasons, but not for medicine. When making tincture, do we use herbs fresh or dried? Um, you can act, it does depend on the plant. Um, uh, some of the sleep herbs that I tend to like to work with a lot are better fresh, in my opinion. Passion flower is one that is nice, fresh or dry. And most of us don't have a whole lot of opportunity to make it fresh unless you get a plant and keep it inside in the winter and, you know, put it outside in the summer. Um, I tried not to focus too much on herbs that for this talk that aren't commonly available, good quality in commerce, like lemon balm is amazing for sleep and stress and makes a fantastic homemade fresh plant tincture. But I have yet to find a commercial valerian tincture that's or not valerian, but lemon balm tincture that has really much of any activity. It's just such a ephemeral plant, even as a tincture. So I left that one off of tonight's spot, um, just in the sake of, of focusing things. But if you've got things at home, I mean, there's so many more plants and the book goes into, it has a lot of plant profiles. We're just focusing on some of the more common in commerce, but you can make tinctures fresh or dry. And the blog that I shared earlier does have, there's like really a whole tincture blog on my website and a short video on showing you how to make a fresh plant tincture. And uh, those are really fun to do if you have your own growing herbs and uh, just almost every plant that you might want to tincture, if you have it fresh, you could tincture it fresh. There are just a couple and not any of the ones for sleep that are not appropriate fresh. Um, cherry bark is one that's not as good of an idea of doing fresh, for example, but that's not a sleep plant. But for passion flower, it is one that if you get good quality dried herb, it does make a really nice dry plant tincture and the techniques are a little different, but relatively similar. I'll refer you to the blog for that. So um, the two sources for the plants, strictly medicinal seeds, and then the other one is companion plants. Companion plants is in Ohio. And what I do, if I do have to buy a plant online because it's not available locally or not available in a trustworthy way locally, I usually place my order in like May and I'll try to get the company to see if they can ship it on a Monday. And I'll try to look ahead to see what the weather is going to be like, <laughs> because I don't want it to get cooked or frozen in transit. And so I'll see like what the weather is across the country during that time. But I have pretty good luck ordering things through the mail, just through priority mail, um, you know, because it's so much more expensive for overnight, as long as I do it during that time of year where it's not too hot, not too cold. I have them ship it over the, you know, starting on a Monday so that there's time to get to me before the weekend. And, uh, and so I have done pretty well. Most plants I can get through local growers. Um, there are a lot of really great local organic growers. Passion flower just happens to be one of the few that I've yet to see um, and yet to see accurately identified in New Hampshire. But, um, but there are a lot of other, if you're, if you are local, you might not be, but um, if you are local to New Hampshire, there are great farms like Warner River Organics and, uh, Langford Homestead Farm and oh, so many, I can't even remember them all, but there are quite a few really good herb farms that sell plants that have really great quality uh, of other plants, but maybe not this one. So yeah, the other one was um, companion plants. So I'll write it down. So companion plants is the one that's in Ohio and strictly medicinal seeds is the one that's in um, Oregon. Let's see. Ah, cool. Somebody um, said that it is the host plant of that butterfly. Awesome. I have not seen it on my plant. But maybe, maybe it is. I'm, I'm not saying it's not the host plant. I just don't know that whether or not we see a lot of them on the plants around here. Um, okay. I think I got to all the questions. So here's a good recipe for sleep tea that I made up years ago, and it's remained one of my favorite sleep tea recipes. It is good for all ages. You would still want to be careful about like medications and that kind of thing, but it is a tea that is safe for kids, safe for elders. It tastes pretty good. Um, it works with herbs that are all pretty good quality dried, although if possible, I would get some of them more direct from the farm, like lemon balm and skullcap are herbs that are much better when they come directly from a farm because they're just really delicate 
plants and skullcap is often uh, adulterated. So really trustworthy sources, but passion flower, skullcap, lemon balm, spearmint, mix them together. If you don't have one of them, you can skip it. Um, passion flowers, the more relaxing herb. So depending upon how relaxing you want it to be, you could use more or less of that particular ingredient. And I brew it small and strong. And then um, with a teaspoon of honey makes it taste really nice. And, uh, and then have that at bedtime. And it's really, really, really nice tea. There are lots of other great herbs that I tend to do more with as tinctures or as a pill, but that that's a combo that's quite nice as a tea and works for most people kind of across the board. So chamomile is another one. And this is another plant that's got quite a bit of research on it, especially in recent years for both sleep and for anxiety. And you know, a lot of times we sort of dismiss chamomile because it's just, it's like, oh, it's the tea that Peter Rabbit drank to calm down, but you know, it's just a kid's plant. It's nothing too special. Um, but really chamomile can be pretty awesome. And a lot of people do really, really well with it. And you can do a stronger cup of tea. You know, what you get in a tea bag, it's usually not the most potent chamomile and the amount that you get in a tea bag is not really very much. I mean, herbalists, when we make our teas with things, we tend to use like heaping spoonfuls and what you get in a tea bag is usually a very small amount. Um, so you start with a tea bag, but if you feel like it's not quite enough, like feel free, feel free to throw two, three, four tea bags in your tea cup or to get a hold of some really good quality dried um, bulk and then make your tea loose with that with an infuser. And that tends to come out really nicely. You can also work with it fresh. You can tincture it. It's just really the flowers that we're working with here. It's those little tops there. This one is frequently misidentified because there are so many daisy family chamomile type things. Um, and so the one of the some of the identifying features of the German chamomile that we tend to work with most often is you've got these very little flowers um, that just has that like roll of petals on the side on the bottom. And then as it blooms, they sort of flip back a lot of times, like they it is in this picture right here. The It's a relatively delicate and spindly plant compared to some of the other quote unquote chamomile type plants. And the aroma is going to be kind of like this sort of like apple, pineapple, hay kind of aroma. It's a really nice, pleasant aroma. Um, there are a few other chamomile substitutes that have a somewhat similar aroma. And usually if they have that aroma and they're a chamomile, you can work with them pretty interchangeably. But the German chamomile is an annual that will self-seed and then come up and then self-seed and then come up. There's a Roman chamomile that's a perennial and pineapple weed that is a weed that doesn't have petals. And I've not worked with them, but they are relatively interchangeable for relaxation with your German chamomile. So this is a plant that's really lovely, not only for sleep and relaxation, but also for digestion. So if I have clients who are coming in with a lot of like discomfort in their bellies, you know, nervous indigestion, gas, bloating, you know, really actually quite a range of things going on in their digestive systems. And they're also kind of anxious. Um, I might consider chamomile and oftentimes it's really nice. Um, for babies, there are a lot of, a um, lot of traditional use around teething and irritability and sleep and colic for babies. And so that's something to keep in mind, but it also works really well for adults with all those things as well. Um, it is a little bit bitter. The more you steep it, the more bitter it gets. It'll actually become stronger medicinally for relaxation as well, but you may or may not like the taste as much. So you can steep it for less and it just won't be quite as strong, but it'll taste a little better with a shorter, just a couple minutes of steep. Um, it's a great anti-inflammatory for the digestive system as well. And, uh, and I don't know who originally said it. I think I heard it from Rosalie de la Fore, but, um, and then I, so I don't know if it was David Winston or David Hoffman or, or who it was that said that chamomile is really nice for fussy babies of any age. So when we're kind of acting like fussy babies, that's a really good time to pull out the chamomile. When you feel like a fussy baby, I know I can be like, I don't personally do well with chamomile because I'm allergic to it, but there are some days where I'm just like, I'm a bit of a cranky pants. And so like, I know my husband would love to be able to give me a cup of a fuzzy baby tea in that moment to like, chill out now, um, let's be nice. And so it's a great herb to consider for that. Um, and, but there is that one caution that it is in the daisy family. So some people are more allergic to that. And so if you do tend to react to 
ragweed, but not just ragweed, but like daisy flowers and things of that nature, you may want to tread carefully with chamomile. It's not super duper common. A lot more people are allergic to ragweed than are allergic to chamomile, but it does sometimes happen. For me personally, I just my throat gets scratchy. And by the time I'm done with a cup of tea, I feel like I have a cold and it's going to last me a couple of days. Or if I'm working with other aster family flowers for somebody else, I would be like wheezing for a couple of days afterwards. So it's not my plan, but a lot of my clients do really well with it. And the research has been very good for it as well, including for like folks at, you know, postpartum after giving birth, um, elders and senior living facilities, taking it as an extract in a capsule format did really well. So even though we tend to work with it most often as a tea and it's pretty decent as a tea, you can work with it in any other format, fresh or dry, and it's still really nice. And we're really working with just the flowers. That's the main part that we're working with. It's kind of more expensive because harvesting those itty bitty flowers is really tedious. Um, I, I remember harvesting my own. It was actually the same patch here. And I spent an afternoon harvesting and it was really lovely. It was like a couple hours and then I dried it and it fit in a jar like this size. It was like, you know, maybe a pint jar of of dried flowers. And I had spent three hours harvesting. If you do have a lot of chamomile and you want to harvest, I hear it works really well to have a, um, a rake. They have, um, rakes for blueberries, blueberry harvesting, and these do work for chamomile harvesting speeds things up a little bit. It is enjoyable to harvest, but, uh, it is very tedious. Let's see. It says, um, Kiki shares that they do a, cold room temperature overnight infusion of chamomile and then put it in the fridge for a few hours and it tastes great. Um, awesome. So yeah, with the cold one, you're going to get more of the aromatics, which are where some of those, a lot of those relaxing properties are at, but you won't be getting a lot of those bitter principles. So it will taste really nice. Um, you'll still get good medicine with a bitter tea, but if that's going to be something that you're not really going to like, then that's, you know, you can do it on a cold. So it's cool to hear that you have a cold. One of my students was sharing that she makes chamomile lattes. So she'll do like the hot tea and then froth milk in it. And, uh, and that, that sounds pretty cool as well. So those were the, the big three. Um, and I didn't know for sure how long I was going to talk about each one of those. So we do have other herbs we can cover. So I'll just kind of show you, cause I think we have until seven 30, if I remember correctly. And so we could talk a little bit about cannabis. We could talk about cabo. We could talk about hops. We could talk about skull cap, which that one I would get from very specific sources because of that adulteration. We could talk about magnolia bark, which is not really available commercially. So you really kind of have to go find a magnolia tree to make it. Um, holy basil or Tulsi, California poppy, blue vervain. We're not going to have time to talk about all these reishi. I will say I don't work with that one that much. Um, and then we'll come back to my shameless plugs later. So any questions? And then also, if you want to just put it in the chat box, um, are there herbs that are really calling to you that you'd like to have an opportunity for chatting about? So, um, so I'll give you a moment. I see, I see a few comments, but any herbs that you're really excited and I can add probably at least two more. Um, or any just other general questions on plants we've covered or in general. I'm seeing cannabis and magnolia, magnolia, skull cap. Any more votes? Well, it sounds like cannabis is intriguing. Oh, okay. So I will start with that. But um, but then if, you know, keep writing in. So if you have other plants and I will, I will see, I'll go by whichever ones are the most popular. So cannabis is a really neat plant. I will say that I was always an herbalist who was just not a cannabis person. It just was never really my plant. And I really, it, it wasn't a plant I worked with. It wasn't a plant I really knew much about. And then everybody <laughs> was taking and asking about cannabis. And I got asked to edit a review, really not edit, but review Tammy Sweet's book on cannabis, which is fantastic. There are a couple of really great cannabis books out there. Tammy Sweet's got a really nice one. And, uh, and so I was asked to, so I read hers, I took her course. So she's been my primary teacher on cannabis, although I do keep tabs on other things as well. And so cannabis does have promise. Also, I've had a lot of clients do really well. I don't dispense cannabis. I mean, I don't dispense herbs necessarily, but I do partner with an apothecary. Um, I don't, you know, we don't provide cannabis, but sometimes clients will 
get a medical card or they'll go to another state and, and they'll get it themselves. And so a lot of people were reporting, especially my clients that are already in states where everything's super duper legal, just how much improvement they were getting with it. So there are pros and cons with cannabis. I mean, it is a very like psychoactive herb. It's more drug-like and it's more like a recreational drug than the other herbs are. That can make it a really powerful ally, but it also means that it's not appropriate for everybody. And when it comes to working with cannabis for sleep, you could be working with CBD only products, which those are going to be a lot easier to find. I know the co-op has some really great quality, um, clearly balanced days and other companies that are really nice that are CBD only. And, uh, and, or you could work with one that also has THC and probably the most potent ones are the ones that have THC and CBD, maybe other cannabinoids too, like CBN. And there are a few other ones that have a little bit more of a relaxing action. And then there are also various terpenes that are aromatic, like myrcene is one of them that also kind of emphasize that more relate, you know, relaxing property. A lot of the companies just are working with isolates. So you're like just getting CBD or you're just getting THC or you're just getting those two. But when you do have more of a whole plant extract that has a little bit of everything, they have found that those are like hundreds of times more potent because you get this really cool synergy and quote unquote entourage effect from all the pieces and parts. Um, THC is probably a little bit better for helping with deep sleep. CBD tends to be less about sleep, but more about, you know, easing anxiety and relaxing. And it's a little bit more of a subtle plant because, you know, it doesn't make you high the way that THC would. And, uh, and so sometimes just being more relaxed is nice and not having that sort of high, like response. Sometimes people really appreciate that as well. Um, let's see, but yeah, when you have the, the combo, there is a little bit extra synergy there. THC tends to be a little bit more deep sleep supportive. I think I said that, but I just wanted to make sure that I did. And, um, and the other nice thing about cannabis is if you are going to work with it, go with the smallest dose that does the job. And you may even find that as time goes on, that you can start to use a lesser dose. If you go for the highest doses that you can possibly take, and even like a lot of what's on the bottles or at the high doses, um, you tend to habituate to those higher doses and the side effects are also more likely with the higher doses as well. And a lot of times people can get much subtler and really nice effects with those, you know, just a few drops of an extract, for example. And, um, and so that's something to keep in mind. Some people do smoke it. If you're ingesting it, it takes you know, anywhere from like a half an hour to two hours for it to kick in. And it's more of a slower, like in the system and it lasts longer before your body gradually metabolizes it. And uh, some of that also depends on how much food you have in your stomach and how fast of a metabolizer you are. Um, whereas if you smoke it, it or vape it or any other, you know, inhale nebulizer, or any other inhalation method that gets into the system really quickly, but then it also goes out of the system really quickly. So some people like it for that immediate effect but you will get a little bit more of a long drawn out. The other thing to be careful about with cannabis is that it does sometimes give people the munchies. And so if it gives you the munchies and then you eat a whole bunch of snacks and then the snacks give you blood sugar, like roller coasters in the middle of the night, that sometimes can make sleep worse. So that's something to, to keep in mind as well. So maybe you like have your, you know, have your regular herb that has a fast action, you know, your non-cannabis herb. And then at the same time, you take a little bit of your cannabis remedy internally. And that way you get a little immediate relaxation from your non-cannabis herb. And then while you're asleep, the cannabis kicks in and then you're not munching throughout the night. So that's a little, little potential trick, but I have a, had a lot of clients do really well, especially in that, like, Peri postmenopausal insomnia that is super common. Um, that is one of many herbs that might be helpful in that particular scenario. You can have side effects from cannabis. Um, some people have blood pressure drop. Um, I have seen folks, I've actually seen quite a few folks who, especially if they combine it with even the smallest amount of alcohol, but not even necessarily with only alcohol, that they have a syncope, which is like a fainting episode where your blood drops basically out from your brain for a moment and people pass out and then sometimes have convulsions. And as long as you don't hit your head on the way down, it's usually not life-threatening, but it's not great. And so that's a possibility. Um, it is addictive. So if people, not 
for everybody, but it can be addictive. Uh, I know people like to say that it's not. And so if you've been working with it and then you decide to go off of it, it's better to wean off of it and maybe have some other herbs, some other relaxing herbs to support that. Because a lot of times the anxiety and the insomnia will actually get worse as you're going off of it. If you've been taking it in like, especially the higher doses really regularly, um, there is a hyperemesis syndrome. So especially again, this is with like the really high use folks who are working with the THC forms recreationally, but they might start like sweating a lot and they feel a lot better when they take showers or baths usually. Um, so that, that does seem there are other symptoms too. You can look it up. Um, so there are some potential side effects. Most people, especially if you're working with those minimum effective doses are very unlikely to have any side effects, but listen to your body. No one plant is right for everybody. So for some people it's great and for some, um, pe some people it's not. So yeah, Wendy mentions that hops works on similar pathways without the side effects. So hops has its own side effects because it is sedating and it's pretty like sluggish um, and it lowers blood sugar and it's a phytoestrogen. Um, so hops and cannabis are related and they both have very similar terpenes. So those aromatic properties are very similar amongst cannabis and hops. Hops doesn't have the cannabinoids, so it doesn't have the CBD and the THC, but it has its own um, compounds like humulone and lupulin and other constituents and, and parts of the plant that are relaxing and sedating. And it is another one that's worth considering, especially in those um, peri and postmenopausal hot night sweats and hot flashes and sleep because it's pretty sedating. It's anti-inflammatory, blood sugar modulating, um, a little bit antimicrobial, but it doesn't work for everybody. There are some people who get a little bit more depressed with hops because it is one of those stronger sedating plants. And it's, I will say, if you have a chance to harvest hops and tincture it, it's super acidic when you first tincture it. It takes a while for those acids, even though they're part of the relaxing property, like they're really caustic. And so I actually like the hops tinctures that have been aged a little bit. So we're still getting a fair amount of the terpenes, but the, the, the alpha and beta acids aren't quite so like I'm going to burn my throat off as you're taking the extract. So yeah, hops is a pretty cool plant too. I don't think I have a slide in here for that one. It's in the book, but I couldn't even get to all the, all the plants. I mostly like to work with hops as a tincture, although you could do other formats as well. It doesn't, it doesn't retain its potency dry quite as nicely. Oh, I guess I do have a slide. Never mind, I lied. So hops, um, so it's, sort of more sedative, more hypnotic. It's one of the stronger sedating herbs, in my opinion. It's super bitter, which means it lowers blood sugar, which is a little tricky. Um, so it might be a good one to have with your dinner and then just kind of let yourself gradually work your way towards slumber. Um, but that, that having the blood sugar lowering effect right at bedtime isn't always necessarily the best Thing, but for some people, it works really well. You can put it in combo blends. I think a lot of people really like to work with it in formulas. I've had a lot of client formulas where we might put a bunch of their tonic formulas or tonic herbs together. Usually they're also dealing with perimenopause and postmenopause if, if I'm including hops in there. And I might have like a daytime blend and a nighttime blend, and I'd put the hops in with their nighttime blend. And usually they did pretty well with that in formula. It's, uh, it's pretty bitter. You can also do interesting extracts. Like you could add it to seltzer and make kind of like your own little beer seltzer. Cause this is what we use to make IPA beer really hoppy. It's kind of a funky flavor, but if you like beer and recognize that it's more of that kind of a flavor than a traditional tea like flavor, you can do some fun combinations with it. You can, it's very bitter. So you can use it as a digestive bitter as well. So like I said, it might be a really nice dinner time ingredient. And, uh, and it is phytoestrogenic. Um, there are some folks who are using it with like gender, um, gender affirmation to promote like a more femme anti-androgenic effect. So for that reason, like if you really wanted to be emphasizing testosterone, um, I, it probably wouldn't be my top choice for that person, you know, reportedly, um, when guys would be out harvesting a lot, you know, the brewers who are working with a lot of hops that they would end up with erectile dysfunction. Um, from being around that much phytoestrogenic activity. And they also reportedly that the women who are out harvesting the hops, that they would end up more fertile um, and more kind of like 
feminine, if you will, from being surrounded by all that phytoestrogenic activity. If you have um, estrogen dependent cancer risk, it is not clear whether or not hops is safe or not. It's an anti-cancer plant in general, and they're all the research on um, estrogen dependent cancers is very preliminary. It's like in labs and test tubes and that kind of thing. Um, there's some suggestion that maybe it's going to be more excitatory for those estrogen dependent cancers, but nothing that's really clinically relevant. So we don't really know yet um, if it's helpful or not helpful in that particular situation. It is a little bit of pain reliever as well. Ooh, Mountain Rose has a nice hops tincture. That's good to know. Um, so a nice plant to consider. It's fun to grow. It can take over. I don't know if my, the people who bought my home and gardens are going to be excited or not excited when the hops kind of eats the, the fence in the, um, in the growing season next year. But, uh, you can also maybe find folks around you who are growing it for beer and then harvest theirs. There's so many, it's like cannabis and that people have bred it for so many different varieties. So there's so many different qualities of aromatics and exact flavors. It's pretty fascinating. Let's see. I know people wanted magnolia. Um, oh, favorite sources for buying herbs. I did mention that a little bit. Um, I should have put my, my, my sourcing slide in here, but I didn't. All right. So besides the valerian hops, passion flower blend, are there any more blends, um, that work well? So there's endless possibilities for combining, combining, and a lot of them do work really well. One formula that I've tended to like making, you got to have access to everything. So that part makes it a little tricky, but passion flower, magnolia, and then um, either skullcap or lemon balm is a really nice combination for just kind of a gentle, but pretty relaxing formula at nighttime. Um, you can also work with any of those individually as well, but really there's quite an endless possibility. When it comes to sourcing, I will say Gaia Herbs makes a lot of really great formulas for sleep that different people like. A lot of them do have, um, say, like ashwagandha in it, which for some people, it's a little bit more stimulating, but for a lot of people, it's a really great herb. So it depends on the person. So you'll want to look at the formulas um, and divide decide whether you want one that's a little bit more moderate or one that's more sedating, but they make a lot of good formulas. Um Urban Moonshine makes a lot of really good formulas. Um, I would look to see if you're in the co-op um, at the Concord Food Co-op, they probably have some really nice ones as well. And uh, where you can just kind of make your own herbs and get to know the plants individually. And that way you get a feel for it and then you can start to combine. Um, so there's really a lot of flexibility. I don't think there's really a wrong answer. It's really just what's gonna work with your body. Let's see, questions. I wanna make sure I didn't miss anything. I'm just going to scroll through that chat box. I know we just have five minutes left. Can you tincture the dried herb like other herbs? So yeah, with cannabis, just to, on the side note, you do need to decarb the cannabis if you want to get the cannabinoid, the THC and the CBD, um, but all the other herbs, and, and usually you do that dry. That's a whole big get Tammy's book or take her class because it's kind of a little bit of a process. But for all the other ones, you can do dry or fresh. I would check out my tincture blog. So just Maria or wintergreenbotanicals.com backslash tincture will bring it up and it tells you how to make fresh and dry tinctures and all sorts of extra resources there. It's similar basic idea, but the percentage of water to alcohol is a little different. And the exact like percentage of herb to alcohol is also a little bit different. So, um, but basically you shove plant in a jar and you shake it and strain it out after a month, but exactly how much plant and how high proof the alcohol is. That's the part that changes. And yeah, so we've got Mountain Rose Herbs has a nice um, hops tincture. Oshala Farm is great for sourcing or sourcing herbs. I do love their dried herbs. They're amazing quality. Uh, any others to look out for for lowering blood sugar before bedtime? So it's interesting because a lot of times blood sugar dysregulation is one of those things that keeps people up. So usually having these plants with your dinner would actually be helpful because it might help mediate, but having it on an empty stomach might not be helpful. So sometimes it's more about timing versus whether or not you want to do it at all. Like I know Gaia makes a formula that's got, I believe it's got fenugreek and magnolia and other herbs that maybe a little cinnamon that help with blood sugar. And a lot of people do really well with that formula, but 
and I would say fenugreek, it's not a sedating plant, but it's a blood sugar um, modulating. That one's more modulating than it is just dropping. Really bitter herbs, um, those tend to lower blood sugar a little bit. Um, for the sleep herbs, off the top of my head, nothing else is really coming to mind. Magnolia, maybe a little, but passion flower, magnolia. So the other herb that I mentioned is you could either do lemon balm or skull cap in that mix. Um, really anything, but those would be two really nice ones. If you're driving, that no problem. I hope you're not texting while you're driving. Um, skull cap, yeah, okay, cool. And how long before bed do you take the tinctures? Any that negatively affect blood sugar besides cannabis? So cannabis doesn't necessarily negatively bl affect blood sugar if you eat a whole bunch of snacks because you're stoned. That Then the snacks affect your blood sugar, but hops can affect your blood sugar. Um, so before bedtime, I usually, for tinctures, they usually have an action within about 15 minutes. They start to kick in, sometimes even less than that. So I would just kind of keep it by the bedside or have that be part of your routine as you like take your herbs, brush your teeth, go to bed. Um, some people do a loading dose where maybe an hour or two, you take like a partial dose and then a little bit more and then a little bit more and kind of build it up. Um, I personally kind of like just taking it right before bedtime and then having it by the bedside table with some water so that if you wake up in the middle of the night, you can take another dose. If you're doing capsules, you can time it about the same, but capsules will usually take closer to a half an hour to break down in your body. It, again, it, it depends on the person, it depends on the herb, and it depends on how much food is in your stomach, but, um, but capsules usually take a little longer. So if you're trying to get to sleep, then having it a little earlier is nice. Um, a lot of the herbs don't stay in the bloodstream for very, you know, more than a couple hours. So if you are waking up in the middle of the night, you could take that other dose if you needed to. So, yeah. Um, so we just have a couple minutes. So feel free to plug any questions in. I love Skullcap. Um, quality matters. So this is one I would grow your own, which is a little finicky plant or get it directly from a farm. Um, Oshala farm has really lovely dried. It does work well, dried or fresh. Um, they're a little different fresh or dry. Usually I tincture the fresh, but you can tincture the dry. And if you've got a good quality dried plant from the farm, um, it's really, really good. It's commonly adulterated. So really like <laughs> know your source very well, but, um, and the adulterant is liver toxic. So that's a problem. And even though I love mountain rose herbs, um, their dried plants, uh, their dried skull cap rather is because it's such a delicate plant. It's, it's, I trust them for identity, but because it's just been handled a little bit more, I don't find it to be as good as from the farm, um, or from your yard. Um, there is, if you're local, um, in Chichester, there's Terra Basics and she does a really, it's micro farm, but she has really phenomenal quality and does grow skull cap. Um, so this is a really nice nervine. It's a really good one for just kind of like cap skull. Like when your nervous system is on edge, skull cap does a nice job. Just kind of like, hello, <laughs> you don't have to react to everything. So the people who are, are extra sensitive to the noises, the smells, the breeze, the scratchy fabric, you know, the, the partner who's breathing next to them, that's like, you know, keeping them from sleeping. Um, you know, any of those things I would think about skull cap. It's just a really nice herb for that. And that's it in a quick nutshell. Magnolia, if you have access to a magnolia tree, because this is one that you kind of have to make yourself, um, but star magnolia tends to work really well. That's a common, um, commonly cultivated magnolia here in the North country. Um, but from what I understand, most other magnolia trees are pretty interchangeable and also tulip tree. The only one I've worked with has been the, the star magnolia that I was growing and deeply miss um, in my old, my old property and my old gardens. And uh, the smell, if you'd scratch and sniff the bark, it's kind of like root beer and lemongrass. It's like this really cool aroma. And that's a good indicator of its potency as well. And so any time of year, um, you can go out and prune off branches like you see in this picture here. If they're smaller, you can just chop them up. If they're bigger, you can, you know, even this, you could probably chop up. This is probably maybe the, the diameter of a chopstick. Um, but usually once I get to about that diameter, I would take a knife and scrape off the bark because the inner bark is just kind of, um, you want the juicy green bark, the outer bark when it's still kind of a smaller branch is fine, but the woody pit that's in the middle isn't really all that strong. So usually I just 
throw that on the compost or do a project with it. But you can tincture it, you could dry it. Um, mostly I tincture it. It's not very potent as a tea. You can also sometimes find it in pill form and it does work pretty well that way. And it's a really nice herb for those cortisol spikes. It helps mellow out cortisol. So any of those reasons why somebody wasn't sleeping well from cortisol spike, either their blood sugar was low or they're still going to need to deal with their apnea, but maybe the apnea or they've got stress or perimenopause, you know, all those things. It's a pretty helpful herb to consider in the mix and uh, just kind of mellows things out. So you can work with it solo or you can put it in formula with other herbs. It goes really nicely that way. So those folks who are waking up at two o'clock in the morning or four hours after they fall asleep, this is one of the herbs that I would think about for that because of the effect on helping with those stress hormones. And we're at time. So thank you so much. Um, let me just go to my shameless plug slides. I do love holy basil, especially as a tea as well. So I do have my book that's just come out. Um, and if you do get the book, there is a whole like sleep course that's going to come with it. We're going to do four two hour classes that kind of work us through a large chunk of the book's material. And it's going to start in June and go through, um, September and all of it will be available online for replay indefinitely. And so if you get the book, you can go to page 178 and that has the promo code for like where to go to get the link to get the into the course and what the promo code is to get the course for free for having the book. And you can order the book through my website, wintergreenbotanicals.com, the best way to support authors. However, you can also get it anywhere books are sold. Um, the, any, that, that particular course is open to anybody who gets the book anywhere. Um, and then there is also an added bonus that if you get the book through me, you get a discount code for 10% off any of my on-demand or online um, live stream classes, which is a huge discount potential. I have classes. My home herbalist series starts in June. That's my introductory series. It's live stream. It's in person too. We do still have space. And, uh, and so that's coming up in June. My seasonal energetics course starts next week. So if you're kind of a more intermediate or advanced student, you might want to learn about energetics and the seasons and materia medica and phytochemistry. And so that'll be starting next week. And that, oh, and Urban Garden Day, really great place to get plants um, coming up in the first Saturday in June. And the slides are all available. Um, if you go to my website, wintergreenbotanicals.com backslash class notes, you can download the slides and all those links are clickable and you'll have them to refer back to back to at least for I'll have it online for at least another month or so, possibly longer, but not forever. So thank you so much for having me. I'm over time, so I will let you go, but have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thanks.